So I had to scramble and find a set of strings, right? And then uh, so I finally found a set, and I did change them here. But I'm driving here because I was, in, you know, I said, okay, I'm driving here, and I looked down at my feet. Oh, I better get Lois to grab my shoes. I was in my slippers. I'm really comfortable with you, Lois. <laughs> but I don't think I should be that. the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, Rise above the four winds, caught up in the heavenly sound. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. All the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, and all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. All the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. When all God's children sing out glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. All God's people singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. All God's children sing in glory and glory. Tribe, every tongue, every, every nation. He reigns. Hallelujah. He reigns. Hallelujah. All God's children sing in glory. Every glory. tribe, every tongue, every nation. He reigns. Hallelujah. He reigns. Hallelujah. All God's children sing in glory, glory. Hallelujah. He reigns. Father God, you surely do. You truly reign. You rule with authority and power. And you invite us in with your grace. Lord, to be able to experience this time together is such a privilege.
and such a treat. So Lord, we look with expectation towards this time of worship. We want to lay down the things, the troubles, the distractions. We want to focus on you and all that you are. Let us never come to the end of our descriptions of how glorious and beautiful you are. You're beautiful, Lord, and your glory expands well beyond the beauty of your creation. Your beauty expands into who you are and who you are in truth and in power and in righteousness. So we worship you during this time. Thank you, Father. so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 22.
Good morning and welcome. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. God bless you. We are here to praise the one who paid the debt and raised this life up from the dead. That's the, his name is what? Jesus. Jesus. We thank him. God bless you. And this is Thanksgiving week. So happy Thanksgiving week to everyone. If you're joining us online, we're happy to have you with us as well. God bless you. We have a special Thanksgiving service on Thanksgiving Day. If you're new with us, it's a one-hour service. It's probably one of my favorite services of the entire year. It's where we simply just praise God and give thanks. There's testimonies, and it's a wonderful time. This coming Thanksgiving, let us know if you are coming because we want to make sure we are careful with the COVID uh, restrictions and guidelines. So just let us know you're coming. But that's this Thursday at 9 a.m. How many can believe that this Thursday is already Thanksgiving? Doesn't it just seem like March was 27 years ago? Well, again, good to be with you. Love you guys. Well, today we're continuing our sermon series, Jesus and Current Social Issues. Jesus and Current Social Issues. We've been talking about a lot of hot topics. Here are just a few of the ones that we covered. We talked about Jesus and what he said about racism, what Jesus would say about BLM. We talked about Jesus and how he wants to use the church to bring unity to a divided country at this time. We talked about God's word and how God wants us to truly help the poor in inner cities and how we can do that. We talked about Jesus and what he would have to say about socialism. We talked about Jesus and what he would have to say about social justice. And then we talked about Jesus and the police controversy. Wow. Look at those topics. Who thought that was a good idea? Are we crazy or what? Uh, well, these are all good topics. They're hot topics, yes. They're controversial topics, some of them certainly. But these are important topics, and that's why we as God's people, we should be speaking about them. Well, last week we began on the topic, Jesus and the church in America. And we noted that right now, there are so many doctrines 
So many political philosophies and social philosophies blowing through the church in America. Ideas that are creeping into the church from the culture. Ideas that are more from the culture than they are from the Bible. So last week we learned that we have to be careful of that, that just because a building has a cross on it, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's truly a church. Just because someone claims to be a pastor, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're from God. So we talked about how we can tell the difference, how we can discern the difference between the true and the counterfeit. How do we do that? That was an important message last week. If you missed that, I encourage you to go check that out because that's an important topic. But this week, we're, in, uh, we're continuing our look at the church in America. And today, what we're going to focus on is the fact that Jesus has a very important role for the church in America to be playing right now. Jesus wants his church to play an important role right now in this country. How many think that America might be in some significant trouble right now? Just turn on the news, or maybe it's better not to look at the news so much. But we're not just talking about the COVID-19, right? Uh, if, if you've been out of the house once, or if you've turned on the, the news once in the last six months, you can tell there's a lot more going on. There, yeah, there is the COVID lockdown. There are the businesses that are struggling and the economic downturn. But there's also division, an incredible amount of tension and anger and division in our nation. And on top of all that, not that we needed more than rioting in the streets and such conflict, on top of all that, we're also still dealing with a very contentious and frankly still contested presidential contest. So no matter where you look, even just a, a casual observer can see that America is a nation in trouble. But Jesus wants his church to play an important role in our country right now. So no matter who ends up winning the presidential contest, how many realize that our problems are not going to be solved politically? Right? What we need now is a major move from God. So today, I think God wants to encourage us as his people. And today wants us to know that we play an important role in America right now. So today, we're going to look at a time in the Bible when God used his people to transform a nation. How many think God can do that again? Almost all of us? You excited about that? Let me ask that again. How many think God can do that again? How many are looking forward to God doing that again? How many want to see that? Amen, all of us. So let's take a look at God's word has to say this morning. But before we do, let's go to him in prayer. And I think I'll use this opportunity to put my mic on. That sounds way better. That sounds way better. Thank God for our sound people. They are truly sound people. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping us. All right, where were we? We were praying to God because we need you, God. So, Father, we're happy that you hear us and that you know our hearts. We love our nation, God, but, Lord, we desperately need you, that your people are crying out to you today, that you would come and do a major work in our nation and God, use us. Use your church the way you want to. Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would be the teacher. Father, that you would set me aside, that you would speak what you want to speak to us today, regardless of what I say or fail to say. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Guard this time in you, Lord. And Jesus, name above all names, we pray it in your name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, so, so let's begin with a serious question. Church, do you realize how important you are to America right now? Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, you are important to America right now. Now, I'm not exaggerating. America, as it was intended to be, cannot survive without the church. Would you say that with me? 
America, as it was intended to be, cannot survive without the church. Let's try that again. America, as it was intended to be, cannot survive without the church. Now, that's not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not just saying that for dramatic effect. I'm saying that because that's absolutely true. And if you think that's me just trying to be dramatic, don't trust me. Why don't we ask the experts? Let's see what our founders had to say about this. John Adams, the second president of the United States, he said this. He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and, mor and religion. Think about that. And he also said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to be, to be government of any other. James Madison, the fourth president, said, we've staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government, far from it. We've staked the future of all our political institutions upon our capacity to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Ben Franklin said, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. One of our founding mothers, Abigail Adams, she wrote, a true American patriot must be a religious person. He who neglects his duty to his maker may well be expected to be deficient and insincere in his duty towards the public. And then finally, from George Washington himself, he said, to the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Our founders were clear that if America ever drifted from God, we would be done as a nation. God's people, the church, we are indispensable to America. America, as it was intended to be, cannot survive without the church. Uh, let me ask a question. Was our nation founded as a theocracy? How many think our nation was founded as a theocracy? Raise your hand. How many think our nation was not founded as a theocracy? Raise your hand. Thank you. How many are not sure so you're not raising your hand? No matter what you answered, you'd probably be almost right in a way, in a way. Because although, yes, our founders did not want a particular state-sanctioned denomination or religion, nonetheless, they knew that if our nation ever drifted from the governance of God in our lives, we were done. That crucial to America would be the rule of God over our culture, at least in some powerful way. That without that, we would be in deep, deep trouble. How many think you've seen America looking like we're sliding more and more into some deep, deep trouble? Well, today we're going to look at two passages from God's Word. And the first passage, it's going to be about what happens when a nation turns from God. But the second pack, uh, passage is going to encourage us, I hope. It's going to show us a time when God actually used his people to turn a nation back to God. And I want to thank and give a quick shout out to Tony Evans because much of what you're going to hear today is based on his work. Um, but we're going to begin with 1 Samuel chapter 8. So if you have your copy of God's Word, and we always encourage you to bring those to church, this is 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 4. God's Word says, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now when someone asks to meet with you, and they begin the conversation with, You are old. right? You know you're in trouble. You know it's not going to go well. They said, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. 
Now, the nation of Israel was being led by God, but Samuel the prophet's getting old. And all the leaders of Israel, they gather together and they come to Samuel with a request. But notice the request. Notice what they say. They say, we not only want a king, but they say what? We, we want a king like all the other nations. We want a king like all the other nations. Now, I'm not surprised when many nations look to the United States and say, now there's a model we could follow. But I am surprised when more and more politicians in America are pointing to other nations and saying, now there's a model we should follow. Verse 8. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. We're going to see why. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. Give them what they want. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now, notice how God interprets the request. He sees right through it. He says, Samuel, don't, don't take this personally. They're not rejecting you. C can you see what they're doing? They're actually rejecting me. God recognizes exactly what they're doing. God has no problem with them asking for a form of government. But these people already have a government. What these people come and ask for is, we want to have a king like all the other nations. In other words, we want to have government. We don't want to have God in government. We don't want to have God as the primary source of leadership in our nation anymore. We want to have government like all the other nations have. There's nothing wrong with government. God has established government. God is, uh, would say government is fine. And government is good unless it becomes a replacement for God unless it becomes a rejection of God. Verse 9, God says, Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly. Warn them solemnly. And let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. God says, Give them what they want, Samuel. But you make sure you tell them from me what happens when you replace God with government. When you try to replace me with government, uh, let me tell them what that's going to look like. So Samuel, here's how you're going to know. Tell them, here's how you will know when you're replacing God's rule with government rule. Verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. So first, he says, first thing you'll see is an increase in war. And notice what else he says. He says, you will also see a lot of your energy and your resources going to keep the government uh, running. How many know that it's pretty hard to replace God? It takes a lot of government to replace God. How many know that it takes a lot of your resources if you're going to try to replace God? Verse 13, the king will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you on that day. God says, okay, you want a government without me? Well, here's how you'll know it's a government without me. It will be a government that increasingly takes. And notice what he says the government will take. A tenth of your grain, a tenth of your vintage, a tenth of your flocks, 
A tenth, a tenth, a tenth. Everyone say a tenth. How many wish it was still just a tenth? This is in the good old days when a tenth would have been completely shocking to these people. A tenth, a tenth, a, a, a tenth. Wait, that sounds familiar from the Bible. A tenth. Uh, what is a tenth? A tithe. What the people were supposed to bring to God. Remember that from the Old Testament? God is warning the people. The government is going to tax you at the rate you're supposed to be giving to me. They are going to take my tithe because they are going to begin replacing me. They are going to begin playing God. They're going to tax you at the tithe rate because they're going to try to be me. The people have tried to replace me in favor of government. Uh, one of the proofs that government has gone too far is high taxation. In order to expand what the government is doing, it just makes sense. In order to increase government programs, it's going to cost more. And therefore, taxes will have to be higher and higher. When we take God out and we try to replace it with government, there is a lot of fallout. And there are a lot of issues that government then begins needing to deal with. And that becomes very laborious. And that becomes very taxing, literally. The reason why God wanted limited government is because it's, it's not supposed to be doing everything. God is telling them, if the culture was under my rule, if the family was functioning the way the family should function, if the church was functioning the way the church should function, then government wouldn't need to be doing everything. And then we wouldn't need to be claim, uh, complaining that our taxes are so high. So God is telling the people of Israel, don't go thinking the government can take my place. Nothing can take my place in the culture. And our founders realized this. They said our whole system of government is based on that truth, that we can't replace God with government. America, when we turn freedom of religion into freedom from religion, there's going to be more fallout than any government can handle. When we take the Ten Commandments off of the walls in a schoolhouse, God would say, you, you better be ready for the fallout. You're not going to have enough government to deal with all the consequences of that. So God says, okay, you want your government to replace me? Okay, but when the government becomes God, it's going to be a mess. You're going to wonder where I am. And he says, I'm not going to be there because why? Because you rejected me. You told me you didn't want me. So God admonishes them. He rebukes them, not because they want a new form of government, but because they want a government that replaces God. The more our nation excludes God, the more we become 1 Samuel 8. The expansion of government, our founders knew it. So God tells these people, you're never going to have enough government big enough to replace me. Or in the words of William Penn, either this nation will be governed by God or it will be governed by tyrants. Can you see why believers are so important in our nation right now? Church, can you see why you are so important to America right now? So let's look at the next passage. The next passage is going to encourage us. It's going to be a time when God used his people to bring a nation back to him. How many are thinking God can do that again? How many, that's one of the things that keeps you going. He's already given us four great awakenings, four revivals. I'm looking for number five. Amen. How about you? Amen. So we're going to look at 2 Chronicles. Here's the setting of 2 Chronicles. This is a time of great turmoil in the nation. Does that sound familiar? Verse 1, the Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, 
The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. So God sends a message to his people. If you seek me, you will find me. He's saying to the church, call out to me now like never before. I'm not trying to hide from you. How many know that God doesn't want to hide on us? Right? Sometimes we get the sense that he's distant, but he's not. I remember when my daughters were very young. They were this size. I was this size. And we would play hide and go seek. Now, when you're this size, you're not that sophisticated in how you play the game, right? But when you're this size, you can think of killer places to hide where they will never find you. I tried that once. How many think it's fun to stay in a hot crawl space for hours waiting for your children to find you, right? I'm like, I don't want that. I want to be with my kids. I don't want them to struggle finding. That's the heart of the father in God is like, you can find me. I, I'm not playing hide and seek with you. Like, I want my kids to find me. And he's telling the church, if we call to him like never before, he's there for us. It says, in their distress, they turn to the Lord. Be honest, how many have seen God use distress in your life to make you lean into him even more? How many think that maybe God wants to use the distress that America is in right now to make his people, the church, maybe lean into him a little bit more? So the nation is in distress. It goes on to give us some details. Verse 5, it says, In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another and one city by another. Okay, so there, there's great turmoil in the nation, right? Sound familiar? And it says it's not only turmoil from without, there was that, but it was also turmoil with, from within, that cities were in upheaval and turmoil. It says... One nation was against another nation, one city against another, because Satan was troubling them with every kind of distress. What, did I read that wrong? Let me try that again. Because the devil was troubling them with every kind of distress. Wait, no, I didn't get that right yet? Isn't that what we'd think it would say? Like when you see cities in turmoil... When you see such distress in a land, when you see that kind of mess, you're like, that's got to be the devil doing that. Who else but the devil would be doing that? National chaos, civil unrest, cultural confusion. When you see that going, you'd be like, no, that's got to be Satan behind that. But that is not what verse 6 says. It says, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. Brothers and sisters, if God is your problem, it doesn't matter who you elect. It doesn't matter who's flying on Air Force One. It doesn't matter what kind of political solutions you come up with. If God is your problem, only God can be your solution. But let's just pause here for a moment on verse 6. Does, does verse 6 mess with your view of God? Wait, God's behind this? God's doing this? I, th I thought God was good, and he only does good. You mean that some of what we're experiencing right now as a nation might be because of God, not the devil? Well, first, let me just start with this. I think a better translation here would actually be that God allowed them to be troubled with every kind of distress. I think that's actually a better translation. But I also think what we're viewing here is the passive wrath of God. Everyone say the passive wrath. 
Now, there is the active wrath of God. That's times when God directly and intentionally brings judgment. Some examples in the Bible come to mind. The fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. The act of wrath of God. Uh, the ten plagues against Egypt. The act of wrath of God. That's when God directly and inten intentionally brings judgment. But there are times when we see the passive wrath of God. These are times when God simply allows the consequences of our foolish behavior to catch up with us. Did God ever do that with you? There's only three of us. Why did I get to be so lucky? That's one of the things that God used me to bring, him, uh, bring me to him. When God simply allows, he warns us, he lovingly admonishes us, but there's a time because he's a gentleman where he says, okay, go ahead. Tim, do not walk that way. Tim, I love you. Don't go that way. It's dangerous. Stay with me. Walk over here. Thank you, God, for loving me that much. And thank you for that advice. I'll, I'll keep it under advisement. But I think I'd want to go walk that way. I think I want to go play with that a little bit. It's not that dangerous. I'm going to be okay. And he allows me to be as foolish as I want to be. Because he's a gentleman. The passive wrath of God. He tries to warn us as a nation. It's not that he wants to zap us. It's just that he allows our foolish consequences to catch up with us. Romans 1 is a good example of the passive wrath of God. We see a people rejecting God. God is trying to woo them. God is lovingly admonishing them. But there comes a point where God says, okay, go, go ahead. Romans 1, three times in Romans we read phrases like this. Romans 1.24, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Romans 1.26, because of this, God gave them over to. Romans 1.28, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. It says he gave them over. It's not like he deliberately made their minds depraved. He said, if you want to keep thinking thoughts against me, if you want to keep thinking thoughts without me and excluding me, it's going to mess with your mind. It's going to warp your thinking. Probably the most frightening thing we read about God in the Bible is that he's a gentleman. Right? That there are times where if I rebel against him, he'll say, okay, I love you, but you can go. That love never forces itself. And God is perfect in love, and he will not force himself on a person or on a nation. The passive wrath of God. He does that with individuals. He does that with nations. I only have one question. How's that working out for us? Turmoil in the streets, decline in our culture, riots, division in our nation... Just watch the news, and I think we are seeing the passive wrath of God. God is love. And, you know, frankly, I think even the passive wrath of God is love because he's trying to use it in the hopes that it will wake us up. Maybe today that's the part that you need to hear. Maybe God's doing that in your particular life right now. Some consequences are coming crashing into your life, and God's saying, I'm, I'm, I love you. I just want you to see, as an individual or as a nation, what it's going to be like if you try to do life without me. So maybe he's asking you what I think he's asking our nation right now. Hey, how's that working out for you? I don't think we need God as a nation. 
I think we can do culture without God. <laughs> and God with tears in his eyes. America. Really? It, it's working out great, isn't it? How far are you going to go? We are in trouble as a nation. And our solution is not going to arrive on Air Force One, no matter who the president is. So here's the encouragement. God speaks to his people. Let's read on. But as for you, he's talking to his people. He talked about the nation, gave us a description, and now he says to his people, but as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Would you read that first verse with me again? But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Encouragement. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. He took courage. Right now, I think there are three types of churches in America. There is the complacent church. There is the complicit church. But there's also the courageous church. And I think God wants us to be a courageous church. I think God is calling on us to be calling on him more and more and praying to him and being the people of God like never before. So he took courage. He removed, check out what, he, what they do. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He cleared house. He got rid of the things in his life, the things in his particular realm of the world that were not supposed to be there, things that were not honoring God. And then what does it say? He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. They started doing the things of God again with passion, which is why I love our prayer meetings every night. I think those are some of the most important things that we do as a congregation for our nation right now. I hear you crying out on our Zoom prayer meetings every night for this nation. I don't think we've missed one night since the beginning of the COVID lockdown, like 280 days of the people of God in this church saying, God, we need you. We desperately need you. So they start doing the things of God again, the prayer, the spiritual warfare, the crying out to God. They began to realize that, no, this is going to take some doubling down of efforts. That church, we are in a warfare right now in this country. It is a warfare for our culture. It is a warfare for our families. It is a warfare for our faith. It is a warfare going on right now. And the people of God, we need to be plugged in and do the spiritual warfare thing. Because apart from a mighty move of God, we are in big trouble. At the church, we cannot be a wall right now. You are important. Believers, you are so important to this nation. Our founders knew that all along, they tried to tell us. That if we ever drift from the rule of God over our personal lives, this country is in big trouble. So he says, then he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them for large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. I'm praying that as God moves in the churches in America that more and more people are going to be attracted to what we have in Jesus. That's what happened here with Asa. And notice what all of them did. Verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord. Now, that's not just a covenant with the Lord. We'll see that in a moment. But this is a covenant to seek the Lord. They said to each other, I'm going to get really serious about praying to God. I'm going to do my part in this spiritual warfare thing. They covenanted with one another. 
They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and soul. They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly. And I love this. And he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. God gave them, God brought the revival. God brought the healing of their land. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal from, I hear from heaven and heal their land. I don't know what other choice America has right now. And again, I'm not trying to be dramatic. It's like we're at a fork in the road. That either we are going to see a major move of God right now, or I, I don't really know what that future could look like for us. But I'm convinced God wants to use his church. I am convinced that God is not done with his church in America. Otherwise, we'd be home by now. Amen? Look around this room. We're still here, aren't we? What does that tell us? That means that God ain't done with us. That means he's got a plan for our lives. And then we could be people of courage like Asa was and say, you know, God, we're, we're coming to you. That we desperately need you. We want to see you do something powerful in this land that people will say that had to be God. I want, we're praying. I love what I hear in prayers each night. I get so encouraged by those prayer times at Zoom because I hear people saying, God, we are looking to you to do a mighty work like never before. Change our whole nation. Can God do that? Is there a precedent for that? Yeah, at least four times in American history. There's a lot of precedent for that in the Bible. Here with Asa. You see it with Nehemiah. You see it with Hezekiah. You even see it with Nineveh. Think about that story. You know the story of Nineveh? That's the story of Jonah. You remember him, that reluctant prophet that resisted God's call on his life? He tried to resist God and ended up having a whale of a time. You know Jonah, right? He, he's like, I don't want to go to those people. I hate those people, God. I hate those Ninevites. Don't make me go there. And God says, I want you to go there. And you, this is the struggle, right? God says, go. Jonah says, no. God says, oh, right? And who wins? God eventually wins. He makes Jonah go. Jonah goes, and he's got this toot about him. You, you see it in the scripture. He goes there, and, he, and he's like, he doesn't want his ministry to succeed. Like, he's hoping that they don't repent. So it says, he goes to Nineveh, and, and I love it, the way the Bible says it. it. It's a very short message he gives them. It's a one-liner. He says, 40 days, and your nation's no more. Right, not a very seeker-friendly message. Not a very encouraging message. Frankly, not a very good representation of God either. But that's his message. 40 days, and you guys are toast. And you almost get the sense that like he's gleeful about it. Like, whoo-hoo, 40 days, and you losers are done. Yeah. And God moves. And they repent. And the whole nation is saved. What an encouraging story. If the God of this universe can use a witness like Jonah, pathetic, if God can use a message like that, if God can use a person who frankly was not a very good representation of God and a whole nation gets saved, I don't know about you, but I'm excited what he can do through the church in America. That this is the time that we need to more than ever be saying, God, we need you. That this is not the time to flinch. This is not the time to give up. There are three types of churches in America right now. The complacent, the complicit, and the courageous. I want God to make us a courageous church.
Jesus is calling us to be salt and light. That's what he told us to be. I want to encourage you because part of what Satan would want to do to you right now is discourage you. If you are a person walking with the Lord, I just want to encourage you that you as a believer are so crucial to America right now that I hope you realize in the heart of God how much he loves you and how important you are in your workplace, in your school, in your neighborhood, just because you're a person walking with the Lord. The Bible tells us, don't get weary in well-doing, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest. If you don't get weary and give up. I think God might be saying that to every one of you who's walking with the Lord. That God might be using you more than you realize right now. You're watching the news and it's troubling, but you have a hope that is beyond this world. There are a lot of Americans right now watching the news and they do not have the hope that we have. That when they look at their country in such turmoil, they are frightened to the core. They don't have what we we have as far as a hope. And when they see you able to be engaged, yes, we need to be, but at the same time, Be a person of eternal hope that you know that no matter what happens, you are going to heaven after this. When you're living like that, with that type of hope, that's very attractive to people. So Jesus said, be a light. And light is especially powerful in darkness. Sometimes you might feel, I just have a little light here in my school, in my workplace. Never underestimate what God could do with that little light. Salt and light, right? We're supposed to make people thirsty. We're supposed to preserve the culture. That's what our founders said. But light, supposed to shine a light the way for people. Even a little light is powerful. Do you remember back when we used to go to the movies? Do you remember that? In case you know, there, there was this time way back before COVID I don't know if you remember, but there, were these, there was this place called a theater. Do you remember that? And you could go and watch a movie, but do you remember first they would always show the public service announcement videos first? You know, all those things. Here's the exits are. Here's the, and here, like, turn your phone off. Remember that one? And there's always the guy seated three rows ahead of you who thinks that that public service announcement is for everyone else but him. Right, so the crucial point of the movie, you're enjoying the movie, and right then, of course, his phone goes off, and the light comes on, and it looks like it's a halogen light, 4,000, right, just shining in your eye. Why? Because it's so dark. Even a little light makes a big difference when the world becomes dark. I hope you're encouraged this morning because in my heart of hearts, I feel like God wants his people encouraged in this hour. It's not a pretty hour. It's not going to be an easy hour in the days ahead, but it will be a time of spiritual warfare, a time, though, of his church being purified of the nonsense, of the minoring in the majors and majoring in the minors. It'll be a time where we're adjusted and polished and purified again to be his people about his work, about his gospel, to be about a cross of Jesus as a necessity for salvation, to be about holiness and goodness and righteousness in Christ, to be about the Holy Spirit living in us, empowering us to live radical lives for him. It'll be about all those things that make his people his people. Just like Asa tuned up the people again and they recommitted to those things. I think that's what God's going to do with the church in America. And I'm praying that he's going to use us like we can't even dream imaginably possible. May God God do that. Now we are still waiting for the votes to be counted. We're still waiting, in a way, for our nation to find out who the next president will be. But no matter the ultimate outcome of this election, 
No matter if it turns the way you hope or if it turns out not the way you hope. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. That's, as Christian, that's where our confidence is. As God's people, we honor government leaders. We pray for government leaders. We vote. We should be engaged and vote for government leaders. But our hope is not in government leaders. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest political frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. What our nation needs right now, the solution is not going to ride on Air Force One. I think the solution is God in his people, living it out day by day. And I commend you because so many of you do that so well. And if anything today, I pray that you are encouraged. That you would just keep doing what you're doing. Because there will come a day where you stand before him and he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Church, don't flinch, don't doubt. Would you pray with me? Let's pray that God is going to use us like never before. Father, we come to you, and our prayer this morning is that you would touch our nation, God. We are crying out to you, Lord, and I know you hear us, that you are not trying to play hide-and-seek with us and win, that like any other father, you actually want to lose the game. Because you said if we would just seek, we would find. So, Father, only you can turn our nation back to you. So we're praying this day that you would touch this land. But, Lord, we as your people, we're saying that you're going to touch us. That's our prayer, that you are going to anoint us, that you are going to use us, that you are going to bring in a great revival. That if you could use Jonah, you could use us. Psalm 85, 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Lord, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Father, do a work that we will see had to be you. Something that we will see happen in our nation that we'll have to realize that that had to be you. That there's no other explanation. Lord, I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters here this morning that you would encourage hearts. That you would take away fear. That you would take away worry and anxiety. And God, you would let us be people who can look at our future and know that we are in the palm of your hands as a nation. We are in the palm of your hands as your people. God, I pray that in whatever days we have left on this planet, that you're going to use us to take a lot of other people to heaven with us. That you'll give us the joy, the opportunity, the privilege of leading many people to your throne, to your cross. Father, like Asa and the people of Israel, we recommit ourselves to you this morning. Make us people not of complacency, not of complicity. people of courage. Father, we thank you for this and we pray it all in your name. Amen. As we sing a final hymn this morning, maybe you're with us, maybe you're visiting. 
Maybe you're visiting online. The God of this universe loves you more than you can imagine. In fact, the Bible tells us, here's the great love story of the Bible, that the God of this universe became one of us. And the Bible tells us why. He, he became one of us so he could become our substitute. He went to a cross to die on a cross for you. That when you and I were lost, when you and I were in rebellion, when you and I were foolish, in sin, that God so loved this world, so loved you, that he became one of us. And not only that, he not only became one of us, the Bible says he became our sin when he was on the cross. That you and I are separated from a holy God, but he did something about that, that he came down to this planet to become one of us, to become our sin. And as he was on the cross that day, he took our punishment upon himself to pay the price for everything we have done. To offer us complete forgiveness and reconciliation with the God who created us. Now this morning, maybe you are feeling far from him. Maybe you're even feeling some of that passive wrath of God. He's letting you be foolish. And some of the consequences are crushing in. That's the love of God calling you home. He's not doing that because he wants to crush you. He wants to wake us up as a nation and as individuals. So if that describes you this morning, if you're willing to turn from your sin and accept Jesus as the payment for your sins, if that describes you, you're willing to turn from sin and turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life as my Savior. Come into my life as the one who died on a cross for me that I could go to heaven forever. If you mean business with God this morning, he certainly means business with you. If that describes you this morning, the cross is the only way you can be saved. If that describes you this morning, simply say, Lord, come into my life. Jesus, I turn from sin. Come and live in me. Change me from the inside out. Just cry out to God right now. Lord, I'm turning from sin. I want to turn from sin. I want to turn from anything that displeases you. And I want you to come into my life and make me new. I love you. Thank you for paying my price. Lord, I want to live my life for you just to say thanks. I'm not trying to repay you, God, but I want to live for you just because I want to say thanks. Here's the great news. If you just prayed that prayer, if, that, if that's your heart this morning, the Bible says that God adopts you like a child into his family. That you can call him Father. Perfect Heavenly Father. If you've made that decision today for the first time or maybe recommitting your life, let us know about that. We'd love to help you get started or restarted in your walk with the Lord. Church, I hope you're encouraged today. Let's stand and sing one final hymn of worship to our great God and Savior.
And let's go out there and be salt and light.
Father God, to be able to come before you and recognize that all our righteousness is nothing but filth and filthy rags. But you are the great redeemer, you are the great restorer, and it's all because of love. Just amazing. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you are doing, that you are living and active and moving among us. And Lord, if you have planted this desire in a soul today, that as the angels are rejoicing for another who's come home, that let us rejoice too in the possibility of a new found salvation. And Lord, for those of us who already know you, that we desire to continue to walk in that righteousness that you granted us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. We love you, and we give all of our praise to you. In Jesus' name we pray. But don't 